category. Good evening, everyone. <laughs> Glad you're here. And uh, let's start with a word of prayer, shall we? Father, we thank you for the chance we have to worship you through the study of your word. And we pray, Father, that you would uh, bless our time together. May it be fruitful for the growing of us as individuals and as a community. And we thank you, Father, for the great privilege we have um, to have access to your word, to be able to read it any time we choose to. And Father, we pray that by your spirit, you would bring understanding and enlightenment as we spend some time again tonight in Jeremiah. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Um, a few pieces of information as we get going, and I may repeat them later, but repetition doesn't hurt. Um, tonight, I am hoping to cover two chapters as usual. Um, and I say hoping because these are really long chapters. Um, and so uh, that will take a little time. Uh, but uh, we'll, we'll see how well I do. If it might be that we only get through chapter 31, but we might make it all the way through 32. 32 is a narrative passage, and uh, you know because it's a narrative passage, it's telling a story, which you can often go through uh, a little bit easier. Um, the other thing is next week, um, I will be teaching on Monday night, like tonight, but I fly out to Nevada with my wife on Tuesday. And for that reason, there will be a Wednesday class in um, Syosset. It will be led by Dr. Pete. Um, he knows it's a little tiny class and uh, um, he will be there. Um, in terms of the following Monday, which I don't have the date, I think maybe the 23rd, um, he will be teaching here. Um, so he'll one day and then he'll be teaching in Syosset also. Um, so Dr. Pete will be here uh, basically three sessions, but one for the Manhasset community, which is uh, going to be a week from next Monday. I will be here next uh, Monday, um, and uh, he will take the following one after that. This is a special trip because I'm leaving my wife there. So this is Michelle's moving to uh, Nevada, and so that's kind of exciting for us as a family. Um, the date I anticipate moving is uh, tentatively scheduled for April 16, and uh, uh, excited about that, although uh, little, you know, wondering what God will have in store. Um, Pastor Henry just announced to the staff today, which is just, you might find this interesting news, that he uh, is go uh, going to have Easter at the Tilla Center this year. Now, we haven't been there for quite some time, since 2019, um, and so that'll be a big return. He's even looking at the possibility of having Good Friday there. Um, so it would be Good Friday all together, and then uh, Easter Sunday morning. So that's interesting also, um, as to how that all will unfold. Um, and for me, that would be kind of a great last service for myself. I won't be preaching there, but I will be uh, there and uh, part of the service, and I'm looking forward, looking forward to that. So those are the pieces of uh, information and news that uh, we have, and uh, with that in mind, why don't we look at our quiz and see how bright our boys and girls are today, and uh, maybe Ken can get that elusive perfect score that he's been looking for. <laughs> if you can get bonus points for harassment, maybe. Um, all right, so we're on quiz 15. And the first question is this. Who carried Judah into exile? Who carried Judah into exile? Nebuchadnezzar, the Lord, Jehoiachin, Zedekiah. Now, I hope we got this correct, but the answer is two individuals. Nebuchadnezzar, he's the one who literally did it, but he is surprisingly the servant of the Lord because it is the Lord. And last week's passage has both. It says, Nebuchadnezzar took you in, and then the next paragraph when God is speaking, he says, I brought you there. And so you definitely have 
both the Lord and Nebuchadnezzar is responsible. And I, I had mentioned last week, I take joy in that because when tough things happen in my life, I don't want to think that, you know, it's the enemy, it's the devil, and God has no control. I like to know that even the difficult things are in God's hands because it helps me trust that whatever's going to happen is going to be ultimately for the good. And so uh, it is both of them. Number two, Jeremiah's letter to the exiles was written about when? Now, this is one of these things where people roll their eyes, dates, Pastor Steve, dates. But they are actually helpful to understand what's going on. A, 627 to 618. B, 618 to 605. C, 605 to 597. And D, 597 to 587. And that is the answer. Um, because Jehoiachin is carried into exile in 597. And while they're there, he writes a letter, which is uh, surprising in, in many of its aspects, but we'll talk about that in a moment. Number three, as we read Jeremiah, it seems the most important book of the law to him, at least the one he makes reference to a lot, is A, Exodus, B, Leviticus, C, Numbers, D, Deuteronomy. And I hear it. It's Deuteronomy. He makes reference to Deuteronomy uh, regularly, implied and direct reference to the book of Deuteronomy. Notice I did not include Genesis. Um, one could, you know, it's one of the book of the law, but it's, it's, you might say, less likely that that would be what he's basing anything on. Number four, when one reads the Psalms, they depict what emotion towards the Babylonians? So when one is reading the Psalms, what emotion do they depict? Now, I didn't mention which Psalm I read last week, but here's the emotions. Love, compassion, fear, hate. And if you look at Psalm 137, glad are they who dash your infants on the rocks. One of the harshest phrases in the entire Bible is addressed towards the Babylonians. There on the poplars we hung our harps. How can we sing the songs of Zion when we're in a foreign land? So they're sad. They're, they're upset very angry, and I think hate is not uh, too strong of a word. Which brings us to number five. What is most surprising in Jeremiah's letter to the exiles? Now, I want to emphasize the word most surprising. A, encouragement to pray to Babel, f pray for, should say pray for, not to Babylon's prosperity. B, pray to return home. C, build houses. D, have babies. And what is most surprising, there's only one answer here, by definition of most. So if you have more than one answer, scratch one out so you don't ruin a point here. It is A, pray for Babylon's well-being, prosperity, with the argument being, if Babylon prospers, you'll prosper too. Babylon prospers, you will prosper too. But it's shocking, particularly since we have like Psalm 137, because we look at this and we say, how would people respond to the sermon? I mean, it, it, it would just be... Uh, very difficult for them to, to deal with. There's a, a wonderful movie, I highly recommend it, called Amazing Grace. It's the story of William Wilberforce. But in the movie, they show a church scene in which the pastor says, returning to the subject of slavery, and half the congregation walks out because they know, oh, here goes the pastor again talking about slavery. Why can't we just have a normal sermon, Pastor? Why are you always getting political on us? 
but it was a very divisive topic in England in the 1700s because the slave trade was lucrative. People made money, and so when they hear the pastor speaking against it, a lot of them walked out. Um, in this sense, when Jeremiah has his letter read in Babylon, pray for the blessing of Babylon. They were angry, very angry. In fact, somebody wrote a letter back to Jerusalem saying, arrest that guy. <laughs> Number six, name the Judean prophets in Babylon. Now, this has two answers which you can make yourself positive, correct answers. But it also has one that you will only know if you are like super paying attention to class. And I don't expect a lot of you to be in that category. Ahab, Zedekiah, Hananiah, Ezekiel. And it is the two easier ones are Ahab and Zedekiah. Now, they're not the Ahab the king and Zedekiah the king. They are Ahab the prophet and Zedekiah the prophet. And they are false prophets. Ezekiel, though, is an exile. I have referred to that in class, but I haven't mentioned that overtly. So you can give yourself grace if you did not get D. He's going to have very fascinating visions, which we're not going to really talk about in class, where he's actually going to get a window from Babylon on what's going on home, back home. He'll actually see it which is very, very fascinating, very unique. God has the ability to do that. So, you know, Ezekiel had satellite television back in the day when nobody had it. But uh, A and D, uh, B, excuse me. In the Book of Consolation, which is Jeremiah 30, 31, and 32, we see three horizons. What are they? A, their current time, the time of Christ, the time of the Exodus, the very last days, theologically called the eschaton. You've heard of eschatology, study of the last days. The eschaton is just another way of saying the last days. But when you say eschaton, you sound smart. So, you know, we pastors, we like to show how smart we are. So I put the eschaton there. But I'm just meaning the last days, because it really is that simple. <laughs> so which of those? It's three of them, all except C. It is not looking back at the Exodus. It is looking towards their current time, the time of Christ, and the very last days. And this will show up again in our talk tonight as we look at these three horizons. I think it's fascinating that if you paid attention on Sunday, we are going to be going through the book of Exodus all year long as a church. I, I was encouraging Pastor Henry. I said, we haven't done a book study in a long time since Esther, uh, which was a year ago, October. And, you know, we had a lot of topical studies on theology, on prayer, you know, things like that. But um, when, when he said, oh, yeah, we'll do a book study, I didn't know he was going to like, go for the whole year here on a very, you know, long book. Um, I'm kind of like glad that I'm going after Easter because we handle the first 20 chapters up to Easter, which are the easy narrative ones. After that, we move to all the laws, which make for more challenging preaching. Uh, not that I can't do it, but in terms of fun, I think I would have more fun with the narrative sections. So I am uh, kind of glad I'm passing the baton at that point. <laughs> But there'll be good stuff ahead, I'm sure. It just means a little more challenging work for the preachers. Which unique term of Jeremiah becomes very important in later history? A, you will be saved. B, I am with you. C, I will heal your wounds. D, Jacob's trouble. Now, the, cheat, the secret to getting this correct, Ken, is that phrase that says unique term to Jeremiah. A lot of books say you will be saved. A lot of books say I am with you. A lot of books say I will heal your wounds. But only one refers to Jacob's trouble or 
Good for you. Uh, Ken just said he got that right, so we, we all corporately celebrate that. And uh, in fact, for you watching online, you can you know, give the little emoji of hand clap there if you like. <laughs> We're very happy for him. <laughs> all right, number nine. In Jeremiah 29, 11, everyone's favorite verse, wonderful verse. It is important to remember, A, it is a plural you. B, it involves repentance. C, it is written to an exiled people. D, it is conditional. And it's all of them. Now, the conditional aspect relates to B. So it's kind of repeating the same thing. In other words, it's speaking of a people that are coming to repentance. It is not the person living like hell that then claims this verse, ah, God has wonderful plans for me, plans to prosper me in a future. To which God is like, excuse me, how are you living? Your, your life is a train wreck. No, but to the person who is seeking to align their lives with the Lord's plans, God says, I got good things in store for you. And that is what the promise is about. So it's a great promise. It's a wonderful promise. But it's important to recognize that it does consist of repentance. And if you looked at the purest context, it is a people in exile. But I think it's fair to say that you could use the term exile metaphorically. A people who maybe got themselves in a, a bind because of their own sin, their own activities. Remember, one of the passages we dealt with last week was everything that's wrong with them that placed them beyond healing, they did to themselves. But then it says, God says, I'll heal you anyway. In other words, there was no cure for their problem. But then God says, I will still cure you because God can do anything he wants. Number 10. Who do we know with confidence read Jeremiah. Who do we know with confidence read Jeremiah? Daniel, Micah, Zephaniah, Isaiah. And actually, there's only one plausible, well, maybe two plausibles, but only one we have with confidence. Daniel. Daniel chapter 9. He says, according to Jeremiah, the time of exile will be 70 years. Micah lived before Jeremiah, so he didn't read it. Isaiah lived before Jeremiah, so he definitely did not read it. Zephaniah does overlap, but his ministry is done by the time Jeremiah is writing. Um, in fact, when God actually tells him to collate and gather all his writings together, comes in chapter 36. We'll be coming to that shortly. Um, and that's when he probably hires Baruch, and that's when it's all, you know, collated, put together. Sermons were written, but they were like in his file, you know, personal file. He delivered the sermon, but now God is saying, put them all together and preserve them in a book. All right. Anyone get 10 out of 10? Uh, not this sun, not this day, huh, Ken? Not, not quite. All right. I mean, that wasn't the easiest quiz. Um, I, keep tell, I keep reminding myself, and then I forget, you got to come up with an easier quiz. got to come up with an easier quiz. I guess I haven't done that. These aren't horrible. We'll expect one in May. <laughs> <laughs> Karen, how'd you do? Oh, okay. May, I'm not doing it then. <laughs> Oh, uh, so anyway, so now let's go to uh, chapter 31, chapter 31. Um, and I uh, want to point out a couple things um, as we move on. We're, we're in another poetry passage. And what's interesting is it keeps switching from masculine to feminine, to masculine, to feminine, 
to masculine to, in one section, feminine, masculine, feminine. Now, we're starting in chapter 31, so we're starting based on this with a feminine in that it's, it's moving. Or actually, the very first verse will be in the masculine. Why am I saying this? Is because you will find language that reflects this. And it's going to be, you know, evident as you're reading through this. I mentioned this in the Syasa campus on Sunday that um, a, a study came out in uh, Fortune magazine that uh, studied 300,000 people. That's huge. 300,000 people responded to the survey. And it was trying to determine who is more empathetic, men or women. I found it funny that you had to even ask the question because overwhelmingly it was women are found to be more empathetic than men. I was not surprised by this. And, uh, you know, so when they revealed the study, I was like, really? You needed a study to determine this? Um, but I'm mentioning that because that's this idea. God is not male. He's not female. He created humanity in his image, male and female. That's why God is like a chicken. Yeah, that's the Bible. In fact, that's Jesus. How I wish I could bring you under my wings like a mother hen. That's a description of God. And yet God is also like a mighty warrior. There are feminine and masculine attributes of God. And so in poetic passages... You might say, why do they write so much poetry? Because the language allows them to do more uh, kind of wondrous things to, to get into the heart and to the feeling. Um, it may not be everyone's cup of tea, but it is a very powerful uh, imagery. Now, here is a kind of another uh, introduction. In these poems, the two most devastating and demeaning images for Israel's sinfulness, both which have been drawn from intimate life of the family, are redeemed and transformed. Do you remember what Jeremiah called the people of Judah? Prostitutes, adulterers. But he's going to redeem those now. The rebellious son becomes the beloved child. The adulterous wife becomes a virgin, a bride, and the mother of many children. This is the great reversal. Oh, that's a phone. Okay. <laughs> I was like, is that our fire alarm going off? It got me nervous there for a minute. <laughs> so we're seeing a great reversal that takes place in this poetry. But here's the next thing. I went over this last week, but I want to re revive again or renew it in terms of this week. As we look at prof prophetic passages, we have Horizon 1, which is the horizon of the prophet's own world or the Old Testament era itself. So you're going to see fulfillment now present in terms of what's going on. Horizon 2, which is the New Testament. These are the dimensions of God's promises here that Christians necessarily interpret in relation to Christ. And Horizon 3 is the, here comes that big word, eschatological horizon of the return of Christ and the new creation. The last days, to put it in non-theological terms. So when we go through this, we will see uh, the variety of these things taking place. Now, let's start with chapter 31. We actually ended last week with the first verse of chapter 31 because it fit that theme, but we'll begin there. At that time, declares the Lord, I will be the God of all the families of Israel and they will be my people. That is in the masculine form. God is speaking and it is in the masculine form. Now, I want to remind you, we are still in the book of consolation, the book of consolation. And so we're in these 
uh, chapters which tell us what's going to happen. Okay, we move now to a feminine section. This is what the Lord says. So feminine takes us from verse 2 all the way to verse 7, if you want to pay attention to that. This is what the Lord says. The people who survive the sword will find favor in the wilderness. I will come to give rest to Israel. The Lord appeared to us in the past saying, I have loved you with an everlasting love. I have drawn you with unfailing kindness. I will build you up again and you, virgin Israel, will be rebuilt. Again, you will take up your timbrels and go out to dance with joyful, with the joyful. Again, you will plant vineyards on the hills of Samaria and farmers will plant them and enjoy their fruit. There will be a day when the watchmen cry out on the hills of Ephraim, come, let us go to Zion, to the Lord our God. This is what the Lord says. Sing with joy for Jacob. Shout for the foremost of nations. Make your praises heard and say, Lord, save your people, the remnant of Israel. Now, let's break that down a little bit. If you remember the very beginning of Jeremiah, chapter 2, we read this. This is chapter 2, verse 2 and 3. I remember the devotion of your youth. This is the Lord speaking. How as a bride you loved me and followed me through the wilderness, through a land not sown, meaning that he had to feed them. Israel was holy to the Lord, the first fruits of his harvest. All who devoured her were held guilty, and disaster overtook them. What the commentator who pointed the remembrance of this passage out was saying is God has used this kind of language before, but it right what follows this is, but you've abandoned me. You left me. But why we're coming here is that we're seeing now this restoration that's coming. Now, here's a quick word. When Jeremiah gets this message of consolation, judgment is still waiting on them. In other words, nothing has happened yet. Nebuchadnezzar has not destroyed Jerusalem, but he has this vision or dream of what is to come. Now, a few things that you would like just skip right over when you're looking at this is you'll see verse 5, again you will plant vineyards in the hills of Samaria. That's northern Israel. And look at this next one, verse 6. There will be a day when the watchmen cry out on the hills of Ephraim. That's another metaphor for northern kingdom Israel. So what you're seeing is that there's a beautiful thing happen. Before the exile, the kingdom was divided. But now God is foreseeing a future of one Israel. Now, if you remember, if you've gone through 1st and 2nd Kings and 1st and 2nd Chronicles, if you were in the northern kingdom of Israel, you weren't allowed to go to Jerusalem to celebrate the Passover. They wanted you to go to Shiloh. They wanted you to go to Dan because they didn't want people kind of like honoring Judah as a place to worship God. So they came up with their own temples. But look at this, verse 6. Come, let us go up to Zion, Jerusalem, to the Lord our God. So this is a change. There's going to be unity. Now, this restoration has six aspects of the judgment suffered by Israel and Judah. Uh, where am I now? Yeah, here it is. This restoration has six aspects of judgment. They had no resting place in exile, a nation torn down, celebrations silenced, vines and plants uprooted, watchmen announcing the invading conqueror and the temple destroyed. Now, why I'm showing you this is because all these are going to be reversed. All these are going to be reversed. You remember the prophet Joel 
the people of Israel are destroyed by a locust storm. And then the prophet Joel says, but the Lord will restore the years that the locusts have eaten. In that same kind of thing, the book of consolation that we're in is letting people know the good things that are coming. You know, going back to our text now, verse 7, this is what the Lord says, sing with joy for Jacob, shout for the foremost of nations. That means the most important nation, Israel. This little runty nation in the mountains of Judea is the foremost of all the nations of the world. Okay. Make your praises heard and say, Lord, save your people. Now that's fascinating because previously, remember, Jeremiah prophesied, don't ask me to save you. You guys are bad. I'm not saving you. But the day is coming when the people cry out, the Lord will hear. So this whole section in the feminine in Hebrew is a reflection of the good things to come. And when you look at, you know, why, you know, pointing out the feminine, look at verse three. I have loved you with an everlasting love. You know, Shanti Feldheim in her book For Women Only and For Men Only, they asked a thousand women what you most need from your husband, respect or love. And the women responded, I like respect, I need love. And the men were asked the same question. What do you need most from your spouse? And the husbands responded, I like love, I need respect. Interesting. And when Paul gives instructions to men and women in Ephesians 5, he actually says that. Submit yourselves to one another out of reverence for Christ, women by respecting your husbands, men by loving your wives. That's the mutual submission. It's nuanced to the gender. Interesting. Apparently what Shanti Feldhain found in her poll was identical to what Paul was teaching 2,000 years ago. And in this, you can see the nature of the feminine in that kind of language. The commentator that I read, he made a comment that to truly appreciate what is going on in this passage, it could be beneficial for the reader to read Hosea. And why is because Hosea, God says to him, marry a prostitute. And this prostitute is unfaithful to him. And then when she gets herself imprisoned and she's going to be on the slave market, God says to Hosea, buy your wife back from the slave market. And the children that she bears are not even his kids. And you see this intense emotion of God's love for his people, despite her unfaithfulness. But why it's helpful to read that is that God is using this very rich, romantic even language for his feelings for his people. You might say he's channeling the feminine side of God's, uh, of the deity. We now move to the masculine section, starting in verse 8. See, I will bring from the land of the north and gather them from the ends of the earth. Now, pausing there for a moment, you might remember Jeremiah's first prophecy back in chapter 1. I see a boiling cauldron tipping from the north that is going to flood through Israel. Well, that was the first somewhat cryptic prophecy of Babylon. But now north is being redeemed. It's, they're coming from the north. They're being released. So we're having a reversal instead of the bad boiling cauldron. Now we have the release of the exiles from the north. Among them will be the blind and the lame, expectant mothers, women in labor. A great throng will return. Now, why mention all those? Because they're fragile and it's going to be safe. Even the most fragile among them will be able to come home in safety and not have to worry. They will come with weeping. Okay, that catches me off guard. They will pray 
and I will bring them back. This weeping is the weeping of joy. I make my mom cry virtually every single day. Every single day. When I put her to bed and I say, Mom, I love you. And then I kiss her on both cheeks and she puts her hands up. <laughs> she always cries. It's, I mean, it's, she just loose on the emotions. It's a result of a stroke to some degree. You kind of like don't filter your emotions, but they're always tears that make her happy, that reflect being loved. She likes to know that she is loved. We all do, really. We all do. In fact, you know, note to everyone here, if there's anyone in your life you haven't told them you love in a while, it's time to tell them again. Um, people never tired, tire of knowing that they are loved. It is, a, it is a good thing. So the next thing, do you remember when Jeremiah said, don't bother praying, he's not going to listen to you? Restoration. They will pray as I bring them back. The lines of communication with the Lord are open once again. On a level path where they will not stumble. So this is that ease of coming back home. Because I am Israel's father. And Ephraim, my firstborn son. Now, does anyone remember when Jacob was blessing the kids and Joseph comes with his two kids and so he goes like this and, and Joseph says no 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 dad that's you got the hands wrong Ephraim was not the firstborn but in preeminence he was by the way this is an important aspect when you're like looking at uh, John 3.16, for God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son. That's why it means preeminent one. It doesn't mean that he was born and God created Jesus. It's that he is firstborn of all creation. He's the preeminent one in the same sense that Ephraim fits that category in terms of what's going on. Hear the word of the Lord, you nations. Proclaim it in the distant coastlands. Now we are going to have a barrage of blessing. A barrage of blessing. I mean, this is the kind of thing, the kind of passage we all would like read over us, okay? I'm gonna show you it on the screen. It's a small font, but you'll be able to you know, pick up the, the red are all the blessings that are coming out here. So here we go. Hear the word of the Lord, all your nations, proclaim it in the distant coastlands. He who scattered Israel, will gather them and will watch over his flock like a shepherd. For the Lord will deliver Jacob and redeem them from the hand of those stronger than they. They will come and shout for joy on the heights of Zion. They will rejoice in the bounty of the Lord, which is reflected in the next line, the grain, the new wine, the olive oil, the young of the flocks of the herds. They will be like a well-watered garden. They will sorrow no more. These young women will dance and be glad. Young men, old as well. I will turn their mourning into gladness, and I will give them comfort and joy instead of sorrow. I will satisfy the priests with abundance, and my people will be filled with my bounty. Now, are those wonderful blessings or not? I mean, absolutely marvelous. Here's a great question to ask though. Did the people of Israel, when they returned from Babylon, see this kind of abundance? They saw elements of this, but this seems to be mostly a horizon three the eschaton. Case in point, if you read Revelation 21 and 22, he will wipe every tear from their eyes and there will be no more sickness and no more death. That has a very similar feel. So this joy, this blessing, this bounty will be 
partially fulfilled in horizon number one when they come home, but completely fulfilled in horizon number three at the end days, which moves us now to the feminine, then masculine, then feminine section. And here comes a surprising shift of gears. Then the Lord said to me, a voice is heard in Rama, mourning and great weeping, Rachel weeping for her children and refusing to be comforted because they are no more. Now, that passage is a look back. Who is Rachel? Anyone know? The patriarch's wife, Jacob's wife. She becomes here a metaphorical mother of Israel. And she weeps because of the destruction that takes place in 587. So context determines meaning. That's what Rachel, because they haven't had that yet. It's going to happen. Nebuchadnezzar is going to come. Rachel's going to weep. And in other words, it's going to seem like the end. There's no one to console her. However, there's going to be this continuing great reversal. So that passage, uh, and by the way, Rachel was buried in Bethlehem. Um, that is uh, important because this verse is going to be used by Matthew in Matthew chapter 2, verse 16 to 18, when Herod wants to kill all the firstborn, uh, not firstborn, all the male children under two years of age in Bethlehem. This is why that prophecy has a horizon one fulfillment and a horizon two fulfillment. Matthew's picking up on the Bethlehem aspect and the, the, the fact that there's great sadness in the killing that Herod does. But in its immediate context, horizon one, it is referring to the sadness of the destruction of Jerusalem. But then the Lord steps in because his whole consolation is about a reversal of fortune. He says, this is what the Lord says. This is moving now to a masculine section. Restrain your voice from weeping and your eyes from tears. For your work will be rewarded, declares the Lord. They will return from the land of the enemy. So there was hope for your descendants. That's a word for Rachel. It's good news. They're coming back, declares the Lord. Your children will return to their own land. I have surely heard Ephraim's moaning. This is so interesting. He keeps using this northern Israel metaphor. So he's broadening who they're talking about. You disciplined me like an unruly calf. Now here's the here's uh, the feminine again, and this is the people speaking about um, their experience. So if you notice, verse eighteen opens quotes. I have surely heard Ephraim's mourning, moaning. You disciplined me like an unruly calf. This is Israel speaking. And I have been disciplined. Restore me, and I will return, because you are the Lord my God. After I strayed, I repented. After I came to understand, I beat my breast. I was ashamed and humiliated, because I bore the disgrace of my youth. And now God speaks. Is not Ephraim, my dear son, the child in whom... I delight. Often I speak against him. I still remember him. Therefore my heart yearns for him. I have great compassion for him, declares the Lord. So what you have here, is, is, this is what you might say, a practical illustration for us that we can see in this historical poetry. Israel describes repentance and God describes his reception to the repentant. I point this out because we often raise a question 
what does repentance look like? I mean, isn't that a great question? If I say, like, for example, let's say you're caught doing something bad. And then the person says, you know, they say, did you hear so-and-so was caught doing X, Y, Z? The next question somebody might ask, are they sorry for being caught or are they truly repentant? It's a good question. Are they sorry for being caught or are they truly repentant? This gives us a window on what repentance looks like. So if I good, go look at it, I strayed, I repented. Repentance, in the New Testament, it's uh, metanoia, and it means I was going this direction, and I made a 180, and I'm going this direction. So it is a change in what you were doing. That's one element of repentance. After I came to understand, I beat my breast. I was ashamed. I was humiliated. They recognize, and there's, I think, a physical aspect of repentance. Whether it's tears or whether it is just heartfelt grief, that's the kind of thing we'd like to see in somebody repenting. But then we move you know, to the Lord's response and you just see the endearments that come pouring out. Ephraim, my dear son. And then he says, a child whom I delight. Though I often speak against him, I still remember him. You know, all this beautiful, beautiful imagery, which brings us now to this next section, verse 21. Set up road signs, put up guideposts, take a note of the highway, the road you take, Return, virgin Israel. Return to your towns. How long will you wander, unfaithful daughter Israel? The Lord will create a new thing on earth. The women will return to the man. Now, there's a lot of interesting stuff here. Virgin Israel, this is the name God gives to what he previously called the prostitute and the whore, virgin Israel. This is so beautiful in that we can be restored. This is the great thing about, I think, Christianity, that he takes the most broken and wounded of us and can make us brand new, no matter who we are, no matter what we have done. And you know, it is often we who struggle with that. I remember years and years ago when James Dobson was meeting with Jeffrey Dahmer, you know, who came to faith in prison. I mean, this horrible serial killer. And it was hard for people to swallow. Is this guy truly repentant? I mean, he was never getting out of jail. I mean, he's there forever. It wasn't he put to death? I'm, I'm not even sure. But the bottom line is we have trouble swallowing that. God doesn't. He's very comfortable with the idea of what repentance looks like. And to, again, the image of Hosea comes through in this. And then the Lord will create a new thing on earth. Now, here we have an extremely difficult passage to translate. Here's a bunch of translations. Here's the NIV says, the Lord will create a new thing on earth. The woman will return to the man. Okay, NIV. What does that mean? Hard to say. Here is the New Living Translation. Israel will embrace her God. Here is the New American Standard updated version. A woman will encompass a man. And here's the message. A transformed woman will embrace a transforming God. Now, what problem we have in translating this is where it's an idiom that we don't have any information what this idiom means. So, here are some of the many thoughts of what this means. The, the, the Hebrew literally says, a woman surrounds or encircles a man. That's what the Hebrew says. A woman encircles or surrounds a man. 
So the translators come and they scratch their heads and they go, do I put that? What does this mean? And so here are some of the thoughts down through history. So Jerome, he is the one who translated the Bible into Latin that the Catholic Church still uses as their Latin Bible. And Jerome felt it was a depiction of Mary encircling Jesus in the womb. So in other words, the Lord will create a new thing on earth. Woman will surround a man. And so he saw it as a prediction of Messiah in the womb of Mary. Then here's another one. It is referring to a great security that comes when God is doing his returning things. And what this is, what is perhaps the most beautiful depiction of security that humanity has? It is a woman holding her baby to her breast. That is just the most beautiful picture of security. Whenever we see that, you know, your baby's just born, you know, when the baby comes out of the womb, I've witnessed this four times, the nurse, the doctor, they don't hand daddy the baby. They immediately put the baby on mom's breast. That's what they do. I get to cut the cord. You know, that was my job. Here, men like knives. Here's a knife, cut the cord. <laughs> Women are the empathetic ones, <laughs> not so much the, the guys. And so in the same sense, some argue that encircling is that embracing like a mother um, that is taking place. Or here's another one, that Israel, the woman, is being embraced by God in love. And the last one is the metaphor of the woman is that warriors will become gentle because the picture of women is one of gentleness. And the depiction of men, particularly in ancient times, is one of warriors. But because God is doing something new, he's taking away that hostility that was bound up in men and making it something gentle. And beautiful. I personally think the message does the best job here. I'm not a big fan of the message in many areas, but sometimes because Eugene Peterson has more freedom in his translation, he can say what direct word for word translations don't say. Like word for word, or as close as you can be, would be the New American Standard. A woman will encompass a man. The problem is nobody knows what that means. But I really think a transformed woman will embrace a transforming God is very beautiful. My next choice though would be the New Living Translation. Israel will embrace her God. Israel will embrace her God. Now you, you might have noticed that sounds similar to the last one I mentioned. All of them are technically possible. All of them are technically possible. It's an unusual passage. We don't have any other piece in Hebrew for helping us to translate it. But one thing we know for absolute sure, it's intended by Jeremiah to bring comfort. And that is why all of those pictures come in that realm. It's something beautiful that is happening. Which brings me now to this last section here of this area. This is what the Lord Almighty, the God of Israel says, verse 23. When I bring them back from captivity, the people of the land of Judah and its towns will once again use these words. The Lord bless you, you prosperous city, you sacred mountain. People will live together in Judea, excuse me, Judah and all her towns, farmers and those who move about with their flocks. I will refresh the weary and satisfy the faint. Now get ready for this next line. At this I awoke and looked around. My sleep had been pleasant to me. This was a dream. This is, for us, 
a very rare picture of how a prophet can sometimes get his message. It was a dream. Now, Jeremiah, I think it's fair to say, has had a tough life. He's been thrown into pits. He's been beaten. He's been, you know, all these things, people rounding him up, putting him on trial, all this kind of stuff. But he goes to bed one night, and we don't see it at the beginning of it. We can't tell. But it was a dream. He wakes up, and he goes, that was a mighty fine dream. It was a gift of God. So the beautiful thing here is the, the fact that we see Jeremiah is refreshed, but we also see a window on how sometimes a prophet gets his word. We knew it intellectually that sometimes they get it through a dream, but now we see it happen. By the way, trivial pursuit here. Which Beatles song was written in one of the Beatles' dreams. Does anyone know? Let it be. What was that? Let it be. Let it be. Exactly. Yeah. Mother Mary comes to me, which for Paul McCartney was his mom. It was his literal mom. Comes to me, let it be. And he said when he, when he had the dream, he called it scrambled eggs. You know, he just couldn't come up with a name. It was just, so he just called it that. But eventually he called it let it be. But... It, Somebody wrote, it kind of tells you, because uh, Paul says, you know how when you have a dream and you write a song? It's like, no, Paul, we don't know what that's like. <laughs> he obviously has a fertile mind and is able to write, you know, pretty good material in his dreams. Apparently, Jeremiah has that same ability, except Jeremiah has the empowerment of God himself. Okay, we now move to what theologians call a theodicy. A theodicy. Theodicy is me showing you how smart I am by giving you a theological word. But what it really means is an explanation of how God does his thing. How does God do his thing? Uh, what part did you say with the dream that whole, um, Yep. That whole period, uh, all of these verses? Or just the last few verses? Verse 26. Say it again. Uh, what part did you say was a dream? Okay, you know what, where did the dream begin? That's a fair, fair question. Um, it seems that it could have begun at the beginning of the whole consolation, which would be chapter 30, the beginning of chapter 30. Because that's when we begin the poetic section. But truth be told, it could be other elements somewhere in there. It doesn't tell us. But the earliest would be chapter 30. Good question. Good question. I actually didn't have that in my notes to teach because I didn't know. And I don't like admitting that I don't know because I like to show I'm smart and use big words like theodicy when I'm teaching. Okay, so verse 27, explanation of how God does things. The days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will plant the kingdoms of Israel and Judah with offspring of their people and animals, just as I watched over them to uproot and to tear down, and we saw a lot of that, to overthrow, destroy, and bring disaster. I will watch over them to build and to plant, declares the Lord. In those days, the people will no longer say, now here's the theodicy. The parents have eaten sour grapes, and the children's teeth are set on edge. Instead, everyone will die for their own sin. Whoever eats sour grapes, their own teeth will be set on edge. So apparently this was an idiom in the ancient world. It shows up in Ezekiel too. And here's what it means. My parents screwed up and I'm bearing the consequences. That's what it means. And God is saying those days are no longer. You will be responsible for your own actions. This is interesting in a couple levels because we live in a generation in which we're regularly blaming our parents for what's wrong in our own life. Now, we realize there's a correlation. If my parents are alcoholics, I might have a propensity towards alcohol. I recognize that. But, like my wife's family, all were alcoholics. Her mother and father, her grandparents, everyone is an alcoholic. 
And so every child, my mother sat, not my mother, my wife sat down and said, be careful. My family has a propensity to alcoholism. Just be careful. Now, they could say, oh, my grandma was an alcoholic, now I'm an alcoholic. But what this is saying, you still have responsibility for your actions. You may have a background that made life difficult, challenging, but it doesn't mean you do not have any responsibility for your actions. And so each one will die for their own sins, except for one to come. I just want to point out, and that is Jesus. You know, it was appointed unto man once to die and then the judgment. All of us are experiencing this because of sin. However, Jesus is the only one who dies, not for his sin, but for our sin. Just a little parenthetical thought. Which now brings us to the new covenant. Verse 31. The days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the people of Israel with the people of Judah. It will not be like the covenant I made with their ancestors when I took them by the hand to lead them out of Egypt, because they broke my covenant, though I was a husband to them, declares the Lord. Now, the immediate New Testament reader sees this and thinks, horizon two, horizon two, horizon two. And that is true. In fact, a little piece of trivia here, <coughs> kind of thing that could show up in a quiz. The longest quote, the longest quote in the New Testament of an Old Testament passage is this passage in Hebrews chapter 8, verse 8 to 12. The longest quote of anything in the New Testament of an Old Testament passage is Hebrews chapter 8, 8 to 12. Now, also, we're celebrating communion a lot right now in this series we're doing of 40 Days of Prayer. The Apostle Paul says, For what I received from the Lord, I passed on to you. On the night that our Lord was betrayed, he took bread and broke it and said, This is my body uh, given for you. After supper, he took the cup and said, This is the cup of the new covenant given in my blood for the remission of sins. So this idea of new covenant is all through the New Testament. But, it has a horizon one fulfillment too. In other words, it's not just speaking of what Jesus inaugurates when he comes. It speaks of what they're going to experience. So verse 33, this is the covenant I will make with the people of Israel. After that time, declares the Lord. Here's principle number one. I will put my law in their minds and write it in their hearts. Principle number two. I will be their God and they will be my people. No longer will they teach their neighbor to know the Lord because they will all know me. From the least of them to the greatest, declares the Lord. So knowing the Lord is number three. And number four, for I will forgive their wickedness and will remember their sins no more. What you could see, if you could see uh, the way my hands are right now, how they're, they move to a wider expansion. What you're seeing in the horizon one is the beginning of what is taking place. When it arrives with Christ, it is the full orbed beauty of what is taking the place. Now, we're seeing images that are coming up from Deuteronomy. We mentioned this last week. Deuteronomy plays very strongly into this. And when you and your children return to the Lord, your God and obey him with your heart and with all your soul according to everything I command you today then the Lord will restore your fortunes and have compassion on you and gather you from all the nations where he scattered you the Lord this is verse 6 of Deuteronomy chapter 30 the Lord your God will circumcise your hearts and the hearts of your descendants so that you may love him with all your heart your soul and live and so what you're seeing is this beautiful depiction of what is coming and even what Jeremiah is describing. And in Jeremiah 9, he alludes to something very similar. He says this, This is what the Lord says. 
Let not the wise boast in their wisdom or strong boast of their strength or rich boast of their riches. But let the one who boasts boast about this, that they have the understanding to know me, that I am the Lord who exercises kindness and justice and righteousness on the earth for these I delight. Now, how does this passage relate to one we're talking about? Verse 34 is a very interesting verse. It says this, No longer will they teach their neighbor or say to one another, Know the Lord, because they will all know me. And so the question is, what does knowing the Lord look like? Does it mean that you know everything that God knows? Anyone want to argue for that one? No. If you want to argue for that, return your cookie. You may not have it. No, we're not going to be like the Lord. What it refers to is when we start to do things like the Lord. And that's why Jeremiah 9 comes in. Those who exercise kindness, justice, righteousness, for these I delight. Now, you might remember there's only one king that it is overtly said that he knew the Lord. It's Josiah. And this was the verse. He defended the cause of the poor, the needy. And so all went well. Is that not what it means to know me, declares the Lord? So the picture of what it means to know the Lord is what we do. And when you show kindness to somebody, compassion to somebody, that is the beauty of knowing the Lord. It means you got, him, you got his personality down. And that somebody's not surprised when you're, when you're exercising kindness, when you're, when you're turning the cheek, when you're showing you know, meekness, when somebody's angry at you. We know those differences. And we know how we can ebb, you know, ebb and flow in our journey. But if you really want to know what it means to know the Lord, that's what it is. And the reason why nobody has to say to you in this passage, know the Lord, is because they're already showing kindness one to another. So it's not speaking of an intellectual knowledge of the Lord. It is speaking of an experiential knowledge of what he does that, that makes all the difference. Verse 35, this is what the Lord says. He who appoints the sun to shine by day, who decrees the moon and stars to shine by night, who stirs up the sea so that its waves roar, the Lord Almighty is his name. Only if these decrees vanish from my sight, declares the Lord, will Israel ever cease being a nation before me. In other words, Israel, you're going to last. This is what the Lord says. Only if the heavens above can be measured and its foundations of the earth below searched out, will I reject the descendants of Israel because of all they have done, declares the Lord. One of the heights of hubris of our generation, remember this phrase that came up in the pandemic over and over again, follow the science, follow the science. It sounded so smart, so wise. The problem is, you know how much science actually knows about what there is to know? Very little. Comparative to what is out there to know? It's a speck compared to what is knowable. And that's why it's saying this example. Science is just a discovery of another little part of what God has created. And we end this uh, chapter this way, verse 38. The days are coming, declares the Lord, when the city will be rebuilt for me from the tower of uh, uh, Hananel to the corner gate. We don't know where that tower is, by the way. The measuring line will stretch from there straight to the hill of Gareb to the turn of Goa. The whole valley where dead bodies and ashes are thrown from the terraces out to the Kidron Valley to the east end as far as the horse gate will be holy to the Lord. The city will never again be uprooted or demolished. 
Now, horizon one, two, or three probably brought hope for horizon one. And in their lifetimes, that was their experience. But because 70 AD and the whole city was destroyed, it's clearly ultimately horizon three, the new Jerusalem that will never be destroyed again. So it probably brought hope to the one, but in the end, it was about horizon three. All right, Jeremiah buys a field. What I'm going to do with this section here is I'm going to kind of narrate it a little bit. I don't think we need to read every word in this section. Some sections we need to look at that way. But the reason why, it's a story, and it's a great story. Um, so now, if you take note of the date, because dates are important, we are jumping now to... 587 or 588, somewhere in that range. What happened in 587? Thank you. Thank you, Lord. Somebody was listening. <laughs> I'm grateful for that. Give yourself 100 on the quiz. <laughs> no, seriously, 587 is when the temple was destroyed. So this happens before then. So if I can set a scene before you, Nebuchadnezzar has now begun his siege of Jerusalem. Now, do you remember the sermon that Jeremiah was giving about this? You know, the one where they wanted to put him to death? That happened right before this. Retreat, give in, surrender. That's the sermon he gave. Zedekiah not real happy with the sermon. Doesn't have the guts to put Jeremiah to death, so he just imprisons him in his courtyard. In fact, I preached on this, I don't know how long ago, but I actually built stocks, and I had them here on the stage, and I talked about Jeremiah being in stocks and this happening. So some of this may sound vaguely familiar to you, but it's all about what happened in the courtyard of that day. So here is what happens. The word of the Lord came to Jeremiah from the Lord in the 10th year of Zedekiah, so we're in 587-588, which is the 18th year of Nebuchadnezzar. The, the army of the king of Babylon was besieging Jerusalem. Now, we're talking the most powerful army in the world at the time, is besieging Jerusalem. And Jeremiah the prophet was confined to the courtyard of the guard in the royal palace in Judah. And so he's not in a good way. And it was because of his preaching surrender. Now Zedekiah, the king of Judah, had imprisoned him there saying, why do you prophesy as you do? You say, this is what the Lord says. I'm about to give the city into the hands of Babylon and he will capture it. Zedekiah, king of Judah, will not escape the Babylonians, but will surely be given into the hands of the king of Babylon and will speak with him face to face and see him with his own eyes. He will take Zedekiah to Babylon where he will remain until I deal with him. And he's going to be dealt with, let me tell you, declares the Lord. If you fight against the Babylonians, you will not succeed. Jeremiah said, the word of the Lord came to me. Now, this is the word of the Lord, not to Zedekiah, but to Jeremiah. The word of the Lord came to me. Hanamel, son of Shalom, your uncle is going to come to you and say, buy my field at Anathoth, because as the nearest relative, it is your right and duty to buy it. So if anyone comes to you and says, I have a bridge in New York I want to sell you, be careful about that. So anyone remember what's important about Anathoth? It is Jeremiah's hometown. And so his family is there. Now, if you look in this map, you can see Judah and you can see Jerusalem. And right above it, let's see where. Yeah, right above Jerusalem, Anathoth. 
very close to Jerusalem. So this relative wants Jeremiah to buy a piece of land. What's wrong with this picture? This would be the equivalent of me wanting to sell you a nice piece of property in Soviet or Russian occupied Ukraine. It's a, it's a beach house. You'll love it. It's, it's wonderful. But the Russians are there. Oh, it's, it's, it's a great piece. This guy just wants to get money. He probably has a thimble full of hope that Jeremiah is going to do anything with this. But the Lord has already spoken to Jeremiah. And he said, you have a relative coming. He's about to sell you a worthless piece of land. Buy it. Oh, come on, Lord. I mean, I am in stocks in the courtyard of the king, and now you want me to spend whatever few dollars I have left on this worthless piece of land. Then, just as the Lord had said, my cousin Hanamel came to me in the courtyard of the guard and said, Buy my field at Anathoth in the territory of Benjamin, since it is your right to redeem it and possess it, buy it for yourself. I knew that this was a word from the Lord. I mean, it's pretty amazing. He has the word, relatives coming, buy it. Knock, knock, knock. I have a piece of land, and you buy it. This, I knew this was the word of the Lord, so I bought the field at Adathoth from my cousin Hanamel and weighed out for him 17 shekels of silver, I signed and sealed the deed, had it witnessed, weighed out the silver on the scales. I took the deed of purchase, the sealed copy containing the terms and conditions, as well as the unsealed copy, and I gave this deed to Baruch, son of Nera, son of uh, Mas uh, Masiah, in the presence of my cousin Hanamel, and of the witnesses who had signed the deed and all the Jews sitting in the courtyard of the guard. All right, Jeremiah is probably... I don't know why I did this, but I did it. He obeyed the Lord. Okay. In their presence, I gave Baruch these instructions. This is what the Lord Almighty, the God of Israel, says. Take these documents, both sealed and unsealed, of a deed of purchase and put them in a clay jar so that they will last a long time. For this is what the Lord Almighty, God of Israel, says. Houses fields, vineyards will again be bought in this land. Now here's the prophecy. Jeremiah, I want you to buy a worthless piece of land that Nebuchadnezzar's army is sitting on. Because the day is coming, it's going to be worth something. And to show that it's going to be worth something, I want you to demonstrate for everyone that it's going to be worth something by buying that piece of worthless land. Now, little side note, put it in a clay jar so it lasts a long time. 1948, something major happened in biblical world. 1948, anyone know what that was? Dead Sea Scrolls were found. It's also a big year for Israel in general, becoming a nation. But the Dead Sea Scrolls were found, a Bedouin throws a rock into a cave, clay shatters. And, and if you're a Bedouin, they, when you find artifacts, they're worth money. So clay shattering meant there's something there. It might be of value. They go up and they find thousands of documents, thousands, that date 2,000 years old, kept in clay jars. So, you know, for those of us who have VHS tapes and, you know, you take an old VHS tape, if you still have a projector that works and you, you pop it in and it's like grainy and it's like it's not working very well or you have a, a floppy disk and you're like, is this thing still work? Like, can you even find a floppy, you know, to stick the thing in? We know it all deteriorates. It all deteriorates. 2,000 years. I want to get yourself some clay jars if you got something in the, of value there. I have to say, being in the desert helps too. <laughs> being in a high humid area like this, not so much. But that was the idea of this. Now, some theology. After I had given this deed of purchase to Baruch, son of Nera, I prayed to the Lord. 
So this is Isaiah praying. No, excuse me, not Isaiah, Jeremiah. Ah, sovereign Lord. By the way, I, I used to sing in church, Ah, Lord God, thou hast made the heavens. And, and it was a very cheerful song. But ah is not actually an expression of joy. It is like, I did what you wanted me to do, Lord. I've had a few of these ah prayers. <laughs> ah, sovereign Lord. You have made the heavens and the earth by your great power and outstretched arm. Here comes the theological truth. Nothing is too hard for you. You show love to thousands and bring punishment to their parents for the sins uh, into the laps of their children after them. Great and mighty God, whose name is the Lord Almighty. It actually is you show love to the thousandth generation. The thousandth generation. Why is that important? All of humanity has not had a thousand generations. In other words, his love is to the vanishing point. That's what the point of that statement is. Greater your purposes and mighty deeds. Your eyes are open to the ways of mankind. You reward each person according to their conduct as their deeds deserve. You perform signs and wonders in Egypt and have continued them to this day in Israel among all mankind that have gained the renown that is still yours. You brought your people Israel out of Egypt with signs and wonders by a mighty hand and outstretched arm with great terror. You gave this land you had sworn to give their ancestors a land flowing with milk and honey. They came in, took possession of it, but did not obey you or follow your law. They did not do what you commanded to them. So you brought all this disaster on them. See how the siege ramps are built up and take the city because of the sword, famine, plague. The city will be given into the hands of the Babylonians who are attacking it. What you said is, has happened as you, see, as you now see. And though the city will be given into the hands of the Babylonians, you, sovereign Lord, say to me, buy a field with silver and have the transaction witnessed. So you get the whole point of this. You're amazing, God. You're, you're strong. You're mighty. You've been through all of us through our history. You're still doing signs and wonders. In fact, one of them is knocking on our gates right now because you predicted Nebuchadnezzar would come to destroy us. And so you want me to buy a field? <laughs> I mean, you can see this is like a non sequitur for Jeremiah. He obeyed. He did what he was supposed to do. Then the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah. I am the Lord, Yahweh, the God of all mankind. Is anything too hard for me? That's a great verse to memorize. I am the Lord, the God of all mankind. Is anything too hard for me? Therefore, this is what the Lord says. I am about to give this city into the hands of the Babylonians and to Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, who will capture it. The Babylonians who are attacking the city will come in, set fire. They will burn it down along with the houses and the people. Have roused my anger by burning incense on the roofs of Baal and pouring out drink offerings to other gods. The people of Israel and Judah have done nothing but evil in my sight from their youth. Indeed, the people of Israel have done nothing but arouse my anger with their hands they have made. With what their hands have made, declares the Lord. From the day it was built until now, the city has so aroused my anger with wrath that I must remove it from my sight. The people of Israel and Judah have provoked me by all the evil they have done. They, their kings, their officials, their priests, their prophets, the people of Judah and all those living in them, they turn their backs to me and not their faces. Though I taught them, that, that is an image, by the way, to look to the Lord is to receive his instruction. To turn your back is to reject it. It's a, it's a metaphor. Though I have taught them again and again, they would not listen or respond to discipline. They have set up their vile images in the house that bears my name and defiled it. They built high places for Baal in the valley of Ben-Hinnom. Just a little map. I've showed this to you before, but this is modern day Israel. And you can see on the bottom of the map, Hinnom Valley. And that is where many of these nasty sacrifices took place. 
Um, they built these high places for Baal in the valley of Ben-Hinnom, sacrificed their sons and daughters to Molech, though I never commanded it, nor did it enter my mind that they should do such detestable thing or make Judah sin. You are saying about the city, so this is Jeremiah's response, by sword, famine, and plague, it will be given into the hands of the king of Babylon. But this is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says. I will surely gather them from the lands where I banish them in my furious anger and wrath. I will bring them back to this place and let them live in safety. They will be my people. I will be their God. I will give them singleness of heart and action. That's quoting Deuteronomy, by the way. So that they will always fear me and that they will go well for them and for their children after them. I will make an everlasting covenant. I will never stop doing good to them. I will inspire them to fear me so that they will never turn away from me. Sounds like Horizon 3. Sounds like Horizon 3 there. I will rejoice in doing them good and will assuredly plant them in this land with all my heart and soul. This is what the Lord says. As I have brought all this great calamity on the people, so I will give them all the prosperity I have promised them. Once more, fields will be bought in this land of which you say, it is a desolate waste without people, animals, for it has been given into the hands of the Babylonians. Fields will be bought for silver and deeds will be signed, sealed and witnessed in the territory of Benjamin, in the villages around Jerusalem, in the towns of Judah, in the towns of the hill country, of the western footholds of the Negev, because I will restore the fortunes, declares the Lord. So you see a horizon one fulfillment in their coming back. They will see many of these things, but this ultimate fulfillment will be horizon three in the final and last day. Whew. Long section tonight. But definitely interesting. Particularly, I like the good dream of Jeremiah. I love that. I want you to think to yourself, and I'll close with this. What do we do to have a good night's sleep? We get a select number bed. We get a my pillow from some guy in Minnesota. We, we, we do all kinds of pills and all kinds of things, and I understand that. But the best sleep comes from a, a beatific or beautiful vision of what God has in store. So principle, feed yourself good things before you go to bed and grant that the Lord gives you beautiful dreams when you go to bed at night. Let's pray. Father, we thank you that we've had the chance to Spend some time in your word again in the book of Consolation. The good news that a beautiful future awaits not just the people in exile, but for us as we anticipate the second coming of our Lord. Father, we do look forward to that third horizon. And Father, we pray, even in the last prayer recorded in the Bible, even so, come Lord Jesus. And we pray that in his name. Amen. Thank you guys for coming. And remember, we will be back next week. I will teach next week. Wednesday, Dr. Pete in Syosset. And the following Monday will be Dr. Pete both places. Um, but next Monday, I am here. And then I'm off to Nevada for a week. All right, see you guys.